It's well known that there's a crisis in workspaces in London. When we saw that the current mayor was looking to develop a strategy guiding how urban planning in London could support the arts, we thought this was a crucial moment to ask, can we design the conditions for culture into the city? If you talk to anyone on cultural infrastructure, you could not have a conversation without talking about housing, without talking about precarious employment, uh, without talking about a worry about future stability, both for careers and for living in the city. I think it's a question of creating, creating out of everyday spaces, places that are kind of refuge from just casual wandering. Currently, resources are focused on making spaces for kind of cultural display in the city, galleries, concert halls, libraries, museums. But our question is, where does the work happen that makes the products that fill these spaces? Part of the aim of this project then was to bring these production spaces to the fore and also focus on the way that their design shapes the kind of work, the kind of labour that takes place in them. Traditionally, we might think of infrastructure as rail lines, pipes, cables, the things that get goods, materials from one place to another. But recent research has widened the notion to include all sorts of invisible or at least less visible structures that underlie or shape everyday life. The materials and shapes of buildings might be the infrastructure for what goes on in those buildings. We were particularly interested in the ways that different kinds of cultural form would relate differently to the city. So we themed our workshops around three broad modes of practice. So I think dividing then those into the notion of performing, of making, and of the virtual made sense because each of those has very different requirements. Our first workshop was around performance. In a sense, performance only exists during the time in which those actions are happening. So by its nature, it's temporary. As well as meaning that we come together to watch performance at specific times in temporary events like concerts, this temporality also affects how the rehearsal of performance happens. Rehearsals are temporary events too. They assemble performers, sometimes in different spaces from one time to the next, to practice their actions together, and then they disperse. As a result, performers often have to be very mobile, moving from one space to the next, leaving no trace of their presence as they move on from a temporary use of that space. To develop this first workshop, we worked with the choreographer Siobhan Davies in her studio complex called Siobhan Davies Studios. They're really thinking about the way that their building needs to respond to changes in dance practice. So in a way, how the infrastructure of that building itself needs to change in relation to the way that dance is being made now. Initially, this was an annex to a school. So the, the ghost of the previous building is still here. And I find that very energizing. What I like about making a place is its constancy, because artists constantly know that there is a place in which they can gather. I think it certainly gave me physical and kind of intellectual heft and more responsibility to have the threads of art and culture making embedded into your city as an utterly natural event to come across. Every day I think the closer we can get to that, the more we are in touch with every single person's creativity. You have culture run through every person's existence anywhere, but it's a city. Then we are behaving in an increased human way. We defined making as any kind of cultural process that takes materials and translates them into objects or artworks that are permanent and concrete. Unlike performers, uh, makers also have full-time access to spaces in which their work takes place. Spaces equipped with tools, materials, and the accumulating traces of their own products to work with and against. A kind of personal archive in that space. Because makers need this kind of stable location, they're more likely to stay put and become parts of communities. But as a result, they're also more subject to issues around urban change and gentrification.
For this second workshop, we worked with Anna Harding, the chief executive of Space Studios, who discussed with us some of the issues facing studio providers in London. Space is a charity set up by artists in 1968 that supports artists by providing uh, studio space. It consists of 20 studio sites and about 840 artist tenants. The creative sector is the fastest growing economic sector in the UK. Uh, the reason artists want to be in London is because that's where the market is. I would argue that having places like this makes London the interesting creative city than it, that it is. Yeah, I suppose artists may be their, their own worst enemies, they're victims of their own success. Well, having made, say, Hackney an interesting place to be, uh, it's attracted a lot of kind of second wave creative industries, or they call them, they're so-called creatives, who can pay, you know, three times as much rent, and that's a problem for the artists. We need investment to secure more long-term premises. There's an awful lot of money wasted on pop-up projects that are really short-term, and I'm not really clear what the long-term benefits of them are. The longer it's left, the worse the problem gets. So invest now in London's future, that would be my message. The final mode of cultural production that we focused on was the virtual. We defined virtual cultural forms as things that were both produced and displayed using media, whether that be digital, print, audio and so on. As all these are produced in the relationship between people and screens or pages, they can hypothetically happen anywhere without special kinds of infrastructure. Writers and others producing this kind of culture often make infrastructure out of places not intended as cultural workspaces. We wondered, can you design cities around an activity that doesn't happen in a specific kind of location? One of the things I think is most remarkable about the impact on the city of the virtual is how little there is of it. At the beginning of, of this boom, a generation ago, when, when it was becoming clear that people wouldn't need to work in offices, they could work from home, from the train, from the cafe, the forecasts were that the, the urban office is dead, that we thought uh, everything was going to change with tech, and, and it didn't. I think it's interesting that really since the 60s, since the idea of the derive and situationism, we haven't had a new way of thinking about cities. There hasn't been uh, uh, a group, a kind of radical group, who's tipped our perception of cities on its head. I don't think necessarily that there's a formulaic type of space that suits the sort of work that London should seek to provide. And you sort of see these things being very overly consciously designed in, say, um, Google's HQ breakout areas and so on. So like, sort of, semi-work, semi-leisure spaces where people are allowed to be both creative and productive and um, I'm quite cynical about those spaces because I think uh, there's, there's, there's large corporate agendas hidden there and the blurring between work time and leisure time and paid time and unpaid time is less dangerous. But I do think that in terms of the economics of space that London could afford a little more to people who perhaps can't afford regular office space, which writers usually can't freelance journalists can't. People's rents are escalating, yet there are properties that remain empty. There are sites that remain undeveloped, yet there's not enough co-working space or creative working space. Um, as a citizen, I would like that situation to be more legible. I'd like to know if there are interim spaces available for six months because that building's not going to be developed. It would be great if there was a way to kind of make sure that the city was at its um, kind of productive, dynamic capacity. So many of us, and I include myself and probably most of my colleagues here, who want to live and work uh, in the city, but the economics of it makes it so hostile to do that. Making, performing and writing represent different kinds of labour that go into the production of urban culture. As attention goes into the need for affordable infrastructure for this kind of labour, 
It's extremely important that we have a better understanding of the different ways that these kinds of cultural production are affected by the city. This project has enabled us to bring together artists and architects in conversations they wouldn't usually have and then bring those thoughts to the GLA as they develop their cultural infrastructure strategy. It's also enabled us to work with architects to develop design proposals for new ways of dealing with cultural infrastructure. All of those things can be found in the report published along with this project. Yatra Mundi's new cultural infrastructure report outlines these findings and offers some really exciting new ways to think about these challenges.